is risen. Amen. Praise God that that's true, and we're going to sing for joy because that's true. I invite you to stand, please. Have a seat. I want to welcome all of you here this morning. Uh, I don't know if you saw as I was driving in this morning, I watched the sunrise and it's a sunny morning and just what you'd want for an Easter Easter Sunday morning because it's the best news ever that the, the tomb is empty and Jesus has risen. And uh, this morning we are going to be thinking about and talking about and celebrating what it means that Christ has risen, what it means for us, what it means as we exalt him, uh, what uh, has taken place because there's an empty tomb. And uh, we're going to start with a call to worship from Romans 8 verses 9 to 11. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you al also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And uh, on Friday, we gathered here and we talked about the death of that Jesus died. And today, we are going to be celebrating the life that Jesus lives and that anybody who is in Christ, who's put their faith in Christ, we have risen into new life with him. Our sins were nailed to the cross. Our sins went into the grave. Our sins died with Jesus. If we put our faith in Christ and we have risen into new life, 
with Jesus. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. So we're going to enter into a time of worship. I invite you to bring your whole heart to the worship of our Lord this morning. And we're going to start with China Ann uh, inviting us into worship with this song. stand. Lord Jesus, we give you all of our praise for what you've accomplished, and now you are reigning over all. 
and we are in your kingdom and all of this is for you. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down.
all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high, In just a moment, we're going to continue into our worship in the spirit of worship uh, by the taking of an offering. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, 
Before we do that, though, just a couple of, of announcements. First of all, uh, right after this service, just like every Sunday morning, uh, we have a prayer room, and it's right over in the corner. And if you would like somebody to pray with you, we've gone through a journey this weekend. Of uh, It's a heavy journey. Good Friday to Easter. And uh, if God's been working in your heart and you just want to pray with somebody, or if there's something that you're burdened with right now and you'd like somebody to pray for you, uh, just head to the, to the prayer room after this. Also, uh, many of you already know that Brenda Hildebrand has gone home to be with Jesus. Um, and if you knew Brenda, you know that that is the, the deepest longing of her heart. She loved Jesus so much, and she is in his presence because Jesus is risen. Uh, she has risen into new life, and she has now gone on to heaven as well. And we, we give praise to that, but we pray for the family as they go in this time of, of grieving without her here. Uh, so let's, let's take some time to pray uh, for them and, and, uh, and for us as well. Father, I thank you that the tomb is empty. We thank you that you did the impossible for us by giving us a way of salvation that we could not have earned. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, and we thank you that you conquered death by bringing him to life and raising him above all names that we can know his name forever, that we can know his love forever, that we can know his friendship forever. And I thank you that for each one of us who is in Christ, that we are in new life already now, that we are empowered by your Holy Spirit now to worship you, even as we are this morning and in our day to day. And we thank you that that's true. And we thank you, Lord, that because we are in this new life, that this new life never ends and that we have your life in you forever and ever in your presence. And I thank you that that's true for Brenda. And I pray that you would comfort her family during this time and encourage them with the good news of what's true that we celebrate this morning. And uh, I pray that you'd bless this offering that we take. And I pray that you would use it for your purposes in your kingdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Would you stand with me with for the reading of God's word? Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going on before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to his, to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell the people, the disciples came here by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Rudy. Thanks for reading the scriptures for us this morning. Am I on? This was on? Okay, good. <laughs> Amen. Ah, now I hear myself. Last week, Pat and I were in uh, the St. Pierre Hospital watching Palm Sunday on my uh, phone. And uh, while well, she was receiving her IV antibiotics, and uh, I'll tell you this morning, I'm just so glad to be in person. It's so different, and I'm so grateful for the people that, uh, yeah, amen. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm so glad to see you too, and uh, I just wish Pat could be with me. She's at home uh, watching online with uh, our son Jonathan, who's been up from Ontario working uh, remote at our house, and uh, so helpful for us. But I'm grateful for this online thing that uh, the guys have figured out, and so... Great, a great thing. I've been looking forward to preaching today for several weeks, and um, uh, I, I want to get focused on the reason for today, but if you would just permit me to update you on Pat's health as well as uh, make some thank yous, I just feel I, I want to do that as I have an opportunity. Um, a huge thank you for all of you, uh, people praying, uh, the texts, the emails, the cards, um, thank you. Forgive, forgive us if we don't respond. Uh, I feel like I'm manning Pat's phone and mine sometimes and not always very well. The meal train has been a lifesaver, as you can imagine, uh, if I was the only cook in the house. Uh, and um, thank you so much. If I don't return your dishes, uh, sorry. I <laughs> There, come out and sometime you'll, you'll find it. Uh, the prayer that is going up, and, and several of you are texting prayers, and, and I try to read, we try to read those prayers. And the scripture and the songs, I try to make sure that sometime during the day we're, we're bathing ourselves in that. And uh, we've had to have limited visits, of course, and... Um, but the, the visits we've had have been really life-giving. We thank you for that. You know, when I announced my retirement in January it, for this June, I had no idea, we had no idea that this was coming upon us. But the Lord knew, and we are completely trusting in him. 
and it's a, it's a marathon. And uh, I just want you to know that we see, received three pieces of good news this past week, and uh, we hang on to those. Uh, as any, any of you that have been on a cancer journey knows that you just grab those little markers and milestones. And uh, one of them is that we have finally a medical oncology appointment this Tuesday for fat. So that's, that's huge because now we're, we're hopefully going past this infection and abscess and moving on to, to chemo and treatment. And, and that's going to address the cancer, God willing. Secondly, um, the tube that was draining that abscess was taken out this past week. One, one less tube out of uh, my wife, which is great to not have to be concerned about. And then thirdly, many of you had prayed for me. Uh, I had a CT scan this past week, and I have no more blood clot. So praise God for that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, great, a great news for us. You know, God gave us a couple weeks ago, Isaiah 43, 19, second half of the verse, which uh, says, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers to run in the desert. And I've just felt that every day God gives us a river. Because if you're in the wilderness, if you're in the desert, you need a river sustaining you every day. And I just feel like every day Pat and I are just looking for that river, that stream in the desert that kind of sustains us. Because we really don't know whether we're at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. We have no, no idea. And if, you, if you've gone through cancer journey, you know that you don't know where you're at. And so we just want to trust in the Lord. <clears throat> and um, we had, uh, when we were in Grace Hospital, uh, we had someone from another church, uh, friends of ours from long ago, uh, she brought these four ceramic eggs, and one of them is faith and love and peace and joy. And, uh, and it was interesting because she said, I have hope somewhere, but I, I couldn't find it, or I had to go buy it, or I, get, I forget what she said. And I was thinking, like, we need some hope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny how that just kind of fixated on that, and, and we've been reminded... Um, daily on our trip to St. Pierre to, to get IV. I don't know if you've been down Highway 59 very often towards St. Pierre, but there is a farm just past the 311 on the right. There is a farm, and its trees are filled with eagles. Drive down there, you'll see them. A dozen or more, sometimes 15, I think. And every time we drive by, we quote Isaiah 40, 31, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And so we keep that. We keep that. We keep grabbing hold of every hope. And, and not just hope about curing cancer, but hope that is solid and, and forever in this life and in the next. And so... Uh, so I wanted to share with you some of that and thank you again so much. We feel carried along by your prayers. And uh, so many others, we're praying for you because I know some of you are going through a similar journey and uh, we pray for you. Let's pray now. And Father, now <clears throat> we're so grateful to be on this day and I'm grateful to be able to be here with my brothers and sisters and... and uh, Lord, I thank you for your sustaining, sustaining grace and, and for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. As you said through Peter, it is a living hope, a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And even though we gotta go through all kinds of trials in this world, we, we know that the persevering of our faith develops uh, this kind of lasting hope. And so God, we fix our eyes on Jesus as we are trying to do this this morning. And Lord, I want to ask you that you might, you might give hope to every situation that comes to mind right now in people's hearts about a loved one, about their own per personal circumstances, that we will be girded with hope, that we will be established in hope, that we will be bathing in hope, that we will be grounded in hope, oh God, so that nothing can shake us. And now, Lord, as we open up your word, we're thankful for the steadfast, immovable, 
solid, rock solid promises of your word. And we ask you now to shape us and reshape us and calibrate and recalibrate our affections so that they might reflect the truth of you alive. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if I were to have a sermon title this morning, it would be called The Transforming Power of Believing in a Risen Lord. And if, if I was to unpack that further, what I wanna say today is just two points. And one of them is that, that the resurrection of Christ that we see counted for in Matthew is, first of all, that there's an objective truth that a living faith has to be built on. And secondly, that there is a subjective reality that a believer must abide in. Okay, so that's the two points that we're gonna talk about this morning. The objective truth that a living faith is built on and the subjective reality that a believer must abide in. Now, if you put those two together, the big idea of the sermon this morning, the big idea is this. But we must know, believe, and sometimes defend the historical truth of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And a major part of doing that is through our own experience of his living presence transforming us and being seen in and through us. So, so the two halves is, number one, the historicity, the rock-solid truth, the reality, but then secondly, our experience of that reality on a day-by-day -day basis as we absorb and live in the life of Jesus Christ today. So we're gonna talk about that as we look at the Gospel of Matthew. Tom Wright, another author says it this way, those who believe in the resurrection need to be constantly on the alert against attack. They also need, of course, to be sure that they are themselves allowing the resurrection to blow constantly like a fresh breeze through their own lives, thoughts, and imaginations. There's no point defending and explaining God's new world if you're still living in the old one yourself. Amen? Amen. See, you are, you are the biggest proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are, because he's come to your life and he's changing you. That's the goal of the Christian faith. Now, by way of illustration, I'd like to take us back about 500 years to a wonderful Polish man that we are all indebted to by the name of Copernicus. Now, Copernicus, Copernicus, in 1532, completed his work arguing that the earth and other planets go around the sun and that the sun does not go around the earth, okay, as they had believed up until that time. And yet he was really hesitant about publishing his research because he would be thought that everybody would laugh at him, scorn, and mock him. Because everybody knows that you see the sun set and you see the sun rise and you, you just, <laughs> you know, it revolves around us. And he'd studied and he, he was convinced. But at the urging of his friends, he finally published his work. It was revolutionary to say the least. Least It took another whole century of research by great minds such as Kepler and Galileo and Newton before Copernicus's ideas were finally universally accepted. People resisted believing because it was absolutely altering their world view. It was backwards. They had to re relearn everything all over again. Some even tried to take some of his findings and fit them into the old theory but they didn't work. Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is that like the discovery of Copernicus. For some people, it's just incomprehensible. People don't come back from the dead. And you're right, they don't. They don't, generally. I mean, do you know anybody that's come back from the dead? No, they don't generally come back from the dead. But this is Easter. This is extraordinary. This is supernatural. This is God breaking into history 
again, suspending the very laws that he created, suspending those laws for the sake of his very own son rising from the dead for the redemption of a people that are his own possession. This is something that God had on his mind from the very beginning before time began even. Most religions of the world, you see, are man-centered like the views of things before Copernicus. But true biblical faith is God-centered. Life revolves around God. It does not revolve around us. And some try to keep a humanistic worldview and then just attach some paste-on Christian values like a patchwork quilt. But they still have the old worldview that I'm the center and God revolves, if there is a God, around me. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't fit. There can only be one center and it is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. And so when worldviews collide, you can expect, expect seismic activity to be happening in hearts and souls and minds. When the truth of what you really are celebrating today hits somebody that is for the first time taking stock that they were created in the image of God, that they are bought with the price of the blood of the Son of God, that they are an accountable souls to the very living God who is going to return and make them stand before him and give an account of it all, that is seismic. That's like the platelets of this earth colliding with each other and the crust of the earth heaving up into, into, into mountains. You cannot have a worldview with man at the center clashing with a worldview that says God is at the center without a whole bunch of stuff going on. So do not be surprised when a loved one you know just puts it all aside and says, I don't believe that stuff. Do not be surprised that when you present the truths of Christianity, that so many huge and various decisions need to be made, it's almost too much to take in. Do not be surprised that there's so much at stake, it's hardly entered into. Because in reality, before anyone is ever going to take new beliefs, they have to disbelieve something else. They have to take apart the the worldview that their lives have been built on, the core values that have sustained them, the reason for living, and then substitute in something that seems as strange as what the people of Copernicus's time thought of the sun revolving, or the earth revolving around the sun. That's why the biographer of Malcolm Muggeridge said this. He he knew what he disbelieved long before he knew what he believed. (laughs) People will need to come to the point of seeing the futility of a human-centered worldview before they will actually embrace a God-centered worldview. Now, if you have loved ones that do not follow Christ, you could feel that this is a colossal task. You could feel that it's impossible. I do. I have loved ones that do not know Jesus and I feel like it is impossible. And I have to constantly remind myself of some very important truths. Number one is that what, what with man is impossible, with God, all things are possible. And all of us who have faith in Jesus are proof of that, for we were once in darkness. And the other thing that I can hang on to is that before anybody ever cracks the door open to, do, to start being a seeker, they are sought. Before anybody ever starts to be a seeker of God, they are sought by God. 
He is willing that none should perish, but all come to repentance. He is that kind of God. So great is his love for that loved one in your life, greater than your love for them. Do not stop praying. Do not stop hoping. Do not stop living your life. Do not hide the reality of your faith as a living hope. Because you're part of the equation that God has for bringing that person to Jesus Christ and to a brand new worldview that will cause them one day, like you and I did, to shake our heads and not even understand how we could have seen life differently once the lights are turned on. Can you relate to that? That's the way God works. And so let's go into our first point of this morning, and that is that the resurrection of Christ is the objective truth that a living faith has got to be built on. You know, I had a homiletics homiletics professor, I don't know, I'm not talking real clear this morning. (laughs) I had a homiletics professor in seminary, Cadia Divinity College in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Anybody from Nova Scotia here? Hey, I hear one, whoo, there we go. Uh, uh, Dr. Harold Mitten, and he said in our homiletics class, he said, don't preach your doubts, God. Don't preach your doubts. People have enough of their own. (laughs) And you know something? I want to tell you, for, for, for over 40 years, if I did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I would have left not only the ministry, but I would have left the faith because there's no faith. What's your faith in if you've got a a living Savior, right? William Lane Craig writes this. He says, the gospel were written in such a temporal, geographical proximity to the events that they record that it would have been impossible to fabricate the events. The fact that the disciples were able to proclaim the resurrection in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in front of their enemies... A few weeks after the death of Jesus, <laughs> think about that, shows that what they proclaimed was true, for they could never have proclaimed the resurrection under circumstances had it not genuinely occurred. There's so many proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe in it. We believe in the historical truth of, its, of Jesus' death and resurrection, and we believe also that the spiritual experience that is built on that must believe in that first. There are dozens of books that you could take off the shelf about spirituality, about religious experience, people that have had dreams and visions, people that talk about a mystical experience with God. But I'm telling you, they are absolutely hopeless if they're not built or lead you to look at the empty tomb and the living Savior, Jesus Christ. D.L. Moody once said this. He said, Noah, Noah's carpenters probably knew as much about the ark as Noah did and maybe more. They knew the ark was strong. It could withstand the deluge. They knew it was made to float. Yet they were just as helpless when the flood came as men who lived thousands of miles away from it. You can believe all the right things about the resurrection in your head. You can say that you're the best apologist on earth. But if you do not own this personally and believe in it and let that living reality of Jesus alive in you change you, it will have of, be of no effect to you. You know the devil believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You see, it's not enough to just believe it, to show up at church on Sunday at Easter because that's what we do. No. What were the words that Leanne sang just a little while ago? Does anybody remember? Could you repeat the main lines? This changes everything. Wasn't that one of the lines? Were you listening? (laughs) This changes everything. It's true. If you really believe that this this man, the God man, the man born in the manger that that had no, God was his father, there was no 
union between Joseph and you believe that he raised three, three years later, he dies on a cross. Three days later, he rises from the dead. He's still alive today. He's in heaven interceding for you. He's coming again back, and he's going to say, hey, what did you do with your life? If you believe that, it changes everything. Our knowledge of the redemption of Christ has to change the way we think. Because before God ever opens eyes and hearts and minds of your loved ones, he first opened the tomb. You need to believe that. It changes everything. And and from the beginning of the time of Christ and his death and resurrection, there have been people who have resisted and denied and, and spoken against the resurrection. I mean, it's, look at the text in Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 to 15, how the guards posted at the tomb that weekend experienced what they considered is an earthquake. An angel of the Lord rolled away the stone. His glory was so incredible that they were frightened out of their wits and they ran back to Jerusalem. And they come into the the temple and they find the chief priests and the elders and and they tell them everything that's gone on. And what happens? They're paid. The cover-up starts. The disbelief. They didn't meet the risen Lord that day, but they did see an empty tomb. And they saw the stone rolled away. And the chief priests quickly paid them and told them to keep it quiet. They hushed the report. Instead, they circulated the rumor that his disciples came in while they were sleeping and stole the body. And that'll help you, soldiers, and it'll help us, religious leaders, and it'll help the governor not to come down on us because they were sure he was dead. You know, another something that my homiletics professor used to say is, Whenever you're reading a text in the Bible, identify with the bad guy. We always kind of want to identify with the good guy, don't we? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a Martha and a Mary, which, you know, oh, I'd like to be McMary, you know, sitting at the feet of Jesus. You could name various texts. But you know what? If, if you identify with the bad guy, boy, there's been lots of bad guys in the last few weeks of studying Matthews 26 and 27. I've been following along with with the preachers that we've had here, great preaching. There's been Judas, the betrayer, and the chief priests and the elders of Israel, blinded by their own spiritual pride. Pilate, what a bad guy. Pilate, intrigued with Jesus, warned by his wife, but what a coward. Indifferent to to justice. And then there's the fickle crowd. Some of them that were sh- shouting, Hosanna, save now on Palm Sunday, was, were around the court when they said, crucify him. Identify with the bad guys. There were the Roman soldiers. They mocked Jesus. They made sport of him. And, and we were told in the last four or five weeks that we've been told, I can be like that. I can be like Peter. I can be like Judas. Well, today in the scripture, we're seeing that the guards were the bad guys, the soldiers accepting a bribe and just muffling the truth of the resurrection of the living God. (laughs) And then the religious leaders that paid them, like, really? To what length will you go to to maintain your spiritual posture? You know, many people will just dismiss the truth claims of the resurrection because they've really never looked into it themselves. They've heard the cheap sound bites and the mindless stock answers to faith questions, and they accept it without investigating. But the living faith that we profess is built on the historical truth. Let's move on to the second point of this morning, and that is that the resurrection of Christ is the subject of reality that a believer, that we must abide in. And uh, 
I don't know if you noticed, but in, in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you know that the person that gives, is given predominance is a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene? She is given predominance in all four of the gospel accounts. And kind of putting, harmonizing them together, we get a picture of what the morning looked like on that Easter Sunday. And as we harmonize them, we realize that Mary Magdalene had to have gotten up very early in Jerusalem. And she'd have had to leave the city gates and and go out toward where there was a a garden with a cemetery there. A a garden and a cemetery that she would have been unfamiliar with being a poorer woman, and it was a rich man's grave. And certainly, it would not have been wise for a woman to go alone. It would have been very reckless. And so along the way, she, she probably had arranged to meet with the other Mary and other people, the women that went with her. And of course, they were on their way there because the job had not been done the day before the Sabbath. On preparation day, they had not finished anointing and spicing the body of Jesus and wrapping it properly before Sabbath started on Friday at 6 p.m. And so they were going back early, it says, before the sun rises on Sunday morning to finish the job. Now it says in John 19 that, that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, richer men, had bought 75 pounds of spices and, and uh, stuff like that, I guess, to prepare his body. 75 pounds. In another text, it says that the women also had prepared an anointing and spices and perfumes. And so they are going now to, to do their bidding in the finalized preparation of Christ's body for burial. And upon arriving at the tomb, there are no guards. They're not there. And they found that the stone has been rolled away. And the angel says to them, do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He has risen. And then there's that wonderful equation, come and see, go and tell. That's what God says to every one of us. Come and see for yourself. Go and tell now that you are a witness. So they return to Jerusalem. And Luke's account tells us that Peter Peter went away wondering what had happened. Because you see, the women were told to go and tell the disciples. Well, when Peter and John were told, they ran to the tomb and... They saw, they actually went inside, they saw the grave clothes. And it says that Peter left wondering what had happened. You see, they're still not believing in the resurrection. Peter and John just had been sort of seeing the evidence, but not the Lord yet. And even though John is two of the disciples that had witnessed that empty grave that morning, his account in chapter 20 gives special emphasis to Mary Magdalene. Not, not his own account, but Mary Magdalene's account. In looking back later on as he writes his gospel, he probably thought that Mary's encounter was so much more important than his because she was the very first one to see Jesus resurrected from the grave. And so John tells her story. It's the story of Mary Magdalene, not Mary the mother of Jesus. Not Mary, the friend in Bethany with Lazarus and Martha. Not Peter. No, no, the rock. uh -uh. Not John, the beloved disciple. No, no, no. (laughs) Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, her story. With her jaded past. With her demonized past. Mary Magdalene. And why? Why is it that Mary Magdalene's testimony is so important that it's included in all four Gospels? The answer is very simple. It's because, it's because she lingered longer. That's the only reason. If Peter and John would have lingered longer, they'd have seen the Lord Jesus that morning instead of that evening. And we know the story how She was weeping outside the tomb. She had the courage to go and peek in. She she turned around and saw this man, and she thought he was the gardener. And she asked him, where did you you put him? 
still expecting a, a dead Savior. And then finally, Jesus speaks her name. <laughs> that must have been very special. Mary. And she falls on her knees and she grabs him and she worships him, it says, and she says, Rabbi, teacher. What an incredible experience. Mary went expecting guards. They were gone. She went expecting a stone. It was rolled away. She went expecting the smell of death. Instead, she met the living Lord, the fragrance of life. I can imagine that the 75 pounds of spices <laughs> plus the stuff that they brought was just filling the air with the fragrance of those wonderful, wonderful oils and so on. Jesus met her in her grief, in her fear, in her bewilderment. The supernatural invaded the natural. The extraordinary invaded the ordinary. Only God can make that happen. But here's the key. Peter and John came to believe in the historical reality of the resurrection that morning. And can you imagine that if, if that's where would it, have, it would have stopped for them, if that would have been the sum total of their resurrection experience, what would it have been to them? They would have been the most wonderful apologists defending the faith. I saw the empty tomb. I saw the grave clothes. Wouldn't that have been wonderful for Christianity? No. Wouldn't that have been wonderful to have written a book, uh, Peter and John, Evidence That Demands a Verdict? No. No. They did not yet have a personal encounter with the risen Lord like Mary did. She lingered longer. And she was rewarded. There's a pretty simple discipleship principle here, folks, isn't there? Learn to linger longer. Linger less ahead of the TV. Linger less online. Linger less with whatever else is the thing that takes your time. And linger longer in the word of God, in prayer, in worship, with other people, talking edifying about Jesus, how your faith is growing, how to pray for each other. You know, there's a passage in Corinthians 15. It says in verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And I want to kind of play with that verse, turn it around. Because we could turn that passage around and arrive at the other side of the same truth. And so it would sound like this. If in Christ we have hope in the next life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. Because I think that's the way some people have embraced their faith. That, that they're in the driver's seat and, and life is just moving along with them at the center and God revolves around them and they're looking forward to hope in the, in the sweet by and by, but they're not enjoying the presence of Jesus because they don't know how to linger longer in his presence in this world and in this life and so they forfeit, we forfeit the incredible blessings because he's promised, folks, how many promises has he made? Oh, I know. I know there are promises about the afterlife. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what the Lord has promised for those who love him. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. But what about right now when he said, in this world you're going to have trouble, but you keep close to me because I have overcome the world. He said, I have come that you might have life and it's going to be abundant. He says, I'm come and I'm called Emmanuel, God with us, with you in the midst of your mess. Over and over again, God says things to us that remind us that our hope is not just a living hope because it's all about the sweet by and by after our resurrection. No, it's after the resurrection of Christ that we have hope. It's a living hope. And it's yours for embracing, if you'll learn to linger longer.
So I guess I, I, guess I want to conclude the message by just asking you to do some soul searching at this Easter, to actually think, it's not a guilt trip, this is, Lord, where could I linger less so that that time could be moved to, to linger more with you? Oh, the Lord will reward you. He, will meet, he wants to meet you. You're being sought before you ever started seeking. Let's pray. Lord, we want, we want to just draw near to you. I confess how slow I am to do this. Lord, you said in your word that as we behold, we are transformed and we want to be more like that. We don't want to merely be apologists and biblicists and fundamentalists. We want to be indwelt followers who have a daily experience of being led by a living Savior because we've lingered longer in your presence. Lord, don't let the resurrection of Christ be a, a day of the year. Don't let it be a tenant of our faith. Don't let it be simply something we defend. Lord, let it be something we live. We ask it for your glory and our good through Christ. Amen. Let's stand together. Of hell, no stopper. 
as he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know. Father, I believe that right now you are doing work in hearts. I believe that right now you are doing work in hearts in this church family and that you are calling us closer to you, that you are growing us in our trust, you are growing us in our joy, you are growing our thirst for your word, you are doing a work in our hearts right now. And we know that, Father, partly because we can see it. We can see it in the conversations that we have. We can see it in this church family. We can see you doing it. And we also know that because you've told us you're doing it. That you have said that you've begun a work in every person who's put their faith in you and you are going to complete that work and you are going to grow us so that we can exalt your son more and more. And I pray that you would continue to do that and I pray that you would grow a collection of hearts that you are the center of, that your son Jesus Christ is the center of, and that we would linger longer. Lord, I pray that we would seek you more, and I pray that you would have your way in us so that your kingdom can grow and that your son will be glorified and that we will have the joy of seeing you work. And I pray all of this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful Easter, everybody.